Hi, you guys. Thanks for coming. Um, my name is Karma Gloss, and this is my husband, Michael. Um, together, we run Kingbird Farm, which is near Ithaca, New York. Uh, we have a small, diverse set up that we've been running for about 20 years now, amazingly enough. It doesn't feel that long, but I uh, feel like we're still learning a lot um, and trying different things. So this particular workshop is going to be based on our strategy of using a very small amount of land to do a lot of different things. Um, and that is what our multi-species grazing is all about. Um, we have approximately 20 acres of open land on our farm, that's all, and that's not a lot to do with, uh, with all the species that we raise and all the different projects that we do. Um, so as I'm going through uh, the slides and telling the stories, keep in mind that we are very small and we are very diverse and we do lots of little things. So none of our uh, operations are very big, it's, it's the whole that's important and that's what makes the farm successful. Um, generally, I'm going to tell the stories because I put this presentation together and Michael here, my husband, is my fact checker um, because I'm known to be a little extravagant with my numbers um, or other things. So <laughs> if you have a specific question about how big something is or how many there are or anything that important, then ask him because I just make it up. Um, <laughs> But I know the animals, and I know the plants, so uh, it's, a very, it's a good team effort, the two of us. So this is our farm. Um, it's it's uh, off Route 79 near Ithaca, New York. It's a hill farm. Um, so there's only one acre of flat land on our farm, and that's where our vegetable field is. The rest is all some sort of incline of some sort. Um, the majority of it is wooded, so basically everything to the right side of the road is our farm. Um, so you can see that it is mostly woods. 80 acres of woodland and then the 20 acres open. And of that 20 acres open, most of it is, is fairly rough pasture. Uh, when we bought the farm, uh, it hadn't been farmed since the 1940s, so there was a lot, a, lot of, a lot of stuff going on in the pastures and they had dragged logs through it. So uh, everything was pretty rough. So we've been bringing it back all these years. Um, the several different species that we raise, one of them is laying hens. We have a small flock of black Australorp laying hens, usually around 200. Uh, we've kept a fairly, a fairly small flock the last few years. Um, I decided I'd rather completely run out of eggs during the busiest time of market than have a surplus of eggs in the middle of the winter and not be able to sell them. So we just keep a little flock. We're always sold out. Right now we're totally sold out because the girls have completely stopped laying due to the cold weather, we think. Just like nothing. I don't know if anybody else is experiencing that, but oh good, it's not just us. But really nothing. It's, it's horrible. Uh, the other breed that we raise, these we call the kingbirds. Um, this originally was Freedom Ranger, uh, which is actually a hybrid, but we selected out and bred birds for several years until we got a relatively stable meat bird that we breed. So all the birds that you see, in fact, all the livestock, we breed on farm. So the birds are bred and hatched and raised on farm. The other meat bird that we do is the Pekin Duck. Uh, we've also been breeding these for many, many years. This is a closed flock of the most incredibly inbred Pekin ducks you will ever meet in your life. Um, some of these hens are pushing, they must be pushing 10 years old now. Uh, we don't cull them out. We just add new ones every year and keep a small flock of breeding birds to produce enough eggs for about 150 meat birds. We also do Tamworth pigs. Uh, both breeding stock and uh, meat, meat animals uh, to raise ourselves. And we do Scottish Highland Red Angus cross beef. Um, we just have a herd of about 15 animals right now, so it's fairly small. And uh, one of the other animals that we're attempting to graze with everyone else, which is the most challenging probably, are our workhorses. Um, we use horses for all of our farm work, you know, tillage, spreading manure, cultivating. Um, there are Norwegian Fjord horses and halflingers. 
this is just an example. I'm gonna the main example I'm gonna go over as uh, as far as how we m you know use a lot of different species on a small piece of land uh, is our main pasture, and that's what this space space is here. Um, it's approximately five acres, and we run the chickens, the cows, and the horses through that same area uh, to get the most out of it we possibly can. Here's just another view. Uh, you can see the barn, the barnyards in the background, the laying hens in the foreground, and the cattle. So not only do we have Scottish Highland cattle, we usually have a couple of dairy cows, and in the summer we also have a leased bull. So all of that stuff has to be kept in mind when you're uh, mingling animals. So the main setup is there was, well, and interesting that I'm gonna go over this and that we just changed this. Um, that is so not rare for us. As soon as we get settled in some system, we go, let's try it a different way. Um, so this actual building does not exist anymore, and we're going to a new system. Um, but this worked well for us for many, many years, and it worked well with a big flock. We've gotten down to such a small flock that we're now gonna do more of a portable system, but this is a permanent hoop house that had a poultry net around it, and then surrounding that were four or five cattle paddocks, um, which everyone got rotated through. So the cattle would go through first, and then we potentially run the horses through, depending on what the forage looked like, and then we run the chickens through as cleanup. Um, and that works really, really nicely. But this is a big house, and it has a big footprint. It was designed for 500 hens. The nice thing about this structure, though, is that it means that we have all the drinkers and the feeders inside the house, which means you're not leaving feed on the pasture, uh, and you're not leaving wet spots in the pasture. And the reason you really don't want feed on the pasture when you're following with other stock is that they will kill that location. If there's any grain left over from chicken feeders out on the pastures, the cows and horses will just completely destroy it, trying to get any last little niblets of grain out of that. So we want the feeders uh, inside. If the feeders aren't inside, then they need to be moved really, really, really often, so you don't get a big buildup of any loose feed anywhere. We, we also captured a new half in New York, in a facility like this, and in terms of uh, stationary structure, there for over, over 15 years, um, then we don't really need to have all that extra nutrients being spread on the pasture. So having it accumulate there, clean that out every few years, um, we can then use that um, nutrient and put it nutrients and put it somewhere else rather than on the pasture. Yeah, that that's a really really excellent point. When you're pasturing chickens, large numbers of them, you're putting down an enormous amount of nitrogen, and these birds have been in this pasture for 20 years. So by making them live inside a permanent structure, you're gathering all that nitrogen and you can use it someplace where you really need it and you don't need it on the pasture. As far as the fencing is concerned in this situation, um, we use really simple fencing for the cows. So our main pastures are four uh, strand high tensile electric wire. That's like our perimeter pastures. And then within that, like within this lower pasture here, we use temporary uh, poly wire, electric poly wire. And over the years, I've put up fewer and fewer lines. I used to try to control my calves, and now I've completely given up. And so the calves really choose whatever paddock they feel like being in at the time. Um, but as long as the mama cows are kept in, then it's not a problem. My mama cows are all very, very respectful of fencing, so I generally just put up one line of poly wire. Um, and it's not even necessarily hot all the time. They're very respectful. And that comes from probably of them years and years being on three lines when I was neurotic about it. <laughs> and they come to respect that. Now there's only one line and they're fine with it. Um, occasionally when we buy in a new cow, we have some issues because they're used to something a little bit more intense. But uh, I guess they get the hang of it because they don't like to be separated. So if all the main herd are in one paddock, they don't want to go someplace else. The chickens, however, need much better fencing. Um, so the, the laying hens are on a four foot um, poultry wire. These are all our nets are from Premier. They last a long time. They're worth the investment. And if I'm gonna buy plastic, which is not my favorite thing, 
I'm going to buy plastic that's going to last a long time. Um, so I really recommend Premier Nets. I've been very happy with them over the years. And then I can, as they degrade, I can retire them to less and less important roles. Uh, but if they're protecting my laying hens way out on pasture, they have to be pretty good. Um, and these, these are a little challenging for me because I'm very short. Um, and it's hard for me to walk over these fences, but Mike doesn't seem to have a problem with them. These are the roles of netting. Um, we generally make a paddock uh, for the chickens that's roughly two nets, uh, one net by one net. So, I mean, that, the size and shape can really vary according to how the cows have grazed, but generally it's something like 50 by 100. Yes. We're using the 150 foot, four foot nets. Yes. 164. Thank you, fact checker. Um, now, the, these nets come in different heights. They come in, there's poultry nets, there's versa nets, there's, we, at one point we're using shorter ones and they seem to work fine. Um, it can be t depend on the type of bird you have. Um, they make ones that have really thick posts. They're called permanets. Um, they're only 100 feet long. Um, some of those have a single spike, some have a double spike. Um, you'll hear, hear people say, well, if you have rocky soil, well, you definitely want to use just the single spike. And then you'll hear people say, oh, if you have rocky soil, you should use the double spike because it's easier to push in. We've used both, and actually they both have seen the work fine. I think I like the, the single ones. Sometimes we have to pound the top in. Um, nets are a pain in the butt. Um, they're, especially if you have a 164-foot net and you don't have giant hands, um, they, you get halfway through gathering up the net, and it's a pain. Um, so we have a love-hate relationship with them. They're hard to get stretched out, they're hard to carry, they do functions, and they do amazing things if we use them. That's, that's the only reason I poo-pooed those permanets, is that with my small hands, gathering up all those heavy-duty posts is really difficult. They're fine for a semi-permanent location, absolutely, but if you're moving birds around, it's not. Yeah, in the back. We do a lot with poultry nets. We have chickens, ducks, uh, pigs, goats, and cows. And I gather from both ends because uh, my hands aren't that big. And it works pretty good as long as you stay on the correct side of the net when you do it and bring them together properly. <laughs> but my question is, uh, with, we have Americana chickens, and that's what the nets were designed for. They're the only species on the farm that their nets will not reliably hold in. Do you have any issues with that with your layers? Yeah, he's saying you have trouble keeping the Americanas. Are they Americanas or Americanas? Uh, Americanas. Yeah. Well, birds that are real good flyers, they will. I mean, and sometimes our birds go over these nets. It's true. We, they do what we call popcorn, like if they get scared, which is rare because my flock is old. Um, we bring in young birds every season, hatch in more. But they're generally many ages, and some of those birds have been there a long time, and they're not phased by much. So they don't popcorn as much as when we had you know, new birds in every season. But sometimes they'll popcorn right over the fences. Um, and you have to get them back in. But I, I don't have a lot of trouble. What is that? They might go through. They squawk when they go through because they get shocked, but they still make it through. They're walking right through the net. That's so rude. Yeah, one more question. Go ahead. We, go ahead. Uh, we actually take a, a couple of strands of single strand poly, poly wire and just put it over the top of the, of the ring of netting, uh, of electronic. And it seems to keep the birds in and also keeps predators out. Yeah, that's a good way to extend the height of your net is to put poly wire around the top. And we did do that when we had heritage breed turkeys, which a four foot net was nothing to them. Um, so that, that, that's a good way to do it. It doesn't make it terribly portable, but it'll help. So there's an example of the net set up for, to release the birds. The cows have already been through there. Um, I like to send the cows through to get the very best forage possible. Um, my cows are either lactating or they're pregnant or they're making meat. So they're always in production and they get the best grass on the whole farm. So once the cows move out, then depending on how well the grass is growing, we'll then put the horses through quickly. Um, I'm going to talk about horses a little bit more in a minute, but they graze really differently than cows. So we send them through just quickly uh, to take... The, the last crappy bits of grass out before the chickens go in. 
each of these paddocks comes right up to the layer house and the layer house has a permanent net around it. So we then open up that permanent net just by propping up a corner and then they can go out into the new paddock. It's such a happy day when they're released into a new paddock, it's amazing. How often do we move it? Um, it really depends. That's a lame a answer, but it depends on how the grass is growing, what the weather's like, how long the cows were in there. But generally, um, it's about a week. The cows, of course, are going to rotate through faster than the chickens are. And that's totally fine, because what that'll mean is by the time the chickens get to the paddock, there's been a little bit of grass growth, so they have really soft stuff to eat. And the fly larvae have hatched. Um, the chickens are not terribly interested in cow pies when they're just fresh cow pies because we don't feed grain. So there's no reason for a chicken to go through a fresh cow pie. They'll just ignore it and then it'll just sit there. However, if it's been sitting there for a couple of days before the chickens go in there, then it'll have larvae in it and they do want that. So then they'll destroy the cow pie. So we like to wait a little bit before the chickens go in there. And this is all in an ideal perfect world. So like I said, sometimes uh, we also graze the horses in there. We generally have between four and eight horses. Right now we only have four, the lowest number we've ever had. Um, but the horses are grazed, at least on our farm, in a completely different way than the cows. Um, they're not producing anything. They're all adults. They're not pregnant. They're not lactating. They're unlikely to become meat. Um, so they don't need the cream of the crop as far as the grass is going. Um, but we do want them grazed. And the other thing is we don't want them too far from the barn because we're using them. So um, they're handled a little bit differently. Usually they'll go into a paddock after the cows and just to clean up some of the grass and then they'll go back in their dry lot. Uh, we just use them quite judiciously. They're easy to fence though. That is one thing I love about the horses. They're just probably easier than our cows to fence. We can put them anywhere all over the farm. If we need a little place mowed, I call in my mowing crew and I can move them, you know, like between the two greenhouses for the day to mow that down. And I can just put it, this is not hot. This is just polywire. You could use baling twine. They don't care. As long as they can see it, they'll respect it. But that's just my horses. So don't, you know, <laughs> not all horses will be that well behaved. These are, they, actually, these are our horses right now. These are our fjord horses right now. Um, I just want to give you an example. Um, this is why horses aren't left in a place for very long, because of how close they can graze. Um, that's their dry lot, and it's completely free of vegetation, completely free of vegetation. The cow dry lot, where there's 15 to 20 animals, still has a green hue. And the reason is, is that horses eat with their front teeth like this. And so they can get right down to the dirt. They can eat everything to the bottom. Cows don't eat that way. They stick their tongue out, they wrap it around the grass, and they pull it into their mouth, and they chew it in the back. So once the grass gets super short, the cows can't do anything with it, but the horses can. Um, so you have to be a lot more careful about grazing the horses that they don't just turn it into a wasteland. They will chew all the way to the ground. I mean, that said, there's times where we want to um, try to sort of change the species or, um, or really eat it down. And if you bring the cows through, they'll leave a lot of stuff. And our horses will eat almost everything, um, especially since they, they seem to know they're only going to be in there for a short time. And, and, and so the cows will go through. It looks kind of straggly. And then w once the horses are done, they've, uh, we only put them in there long enough to sort of mow it down, but not too much. Again, they'll... they'll do too much, um, but they they can really help the pasture as far as if, if we're careful of, of getting rid of weed, some weed species and things like that. We don't want there. So as as far as how the horses are handled in our overall rotation, I would say that in a lot of seasons the horses are in on hay. Um, if it's a drought year with our limited pasture resources, it's all going to the cows. Um, and we can't really afford to put the horses on grass. Uh, we really need to save it all for the cows. So they'll be on hay way before the cows will. Um, and that's fine. You know, first cutting dry grass hay is totally fine. Our fjord horses are fat cows almost all the time. So they do not need the quality that, that the cows do. 
And again, a lot of times we want them in the barn because we want to be able to use them. We, it's, it's much harder to harness up your horses if they're way out where the cows are um, than if they're near the barnyard eating hay instead. Um, this is the upper pasture. This is another place where we do multi-species grazing. And you'll notice that both of these two pa main pastures that we have are primarily just cows and poultry, cows and poultry. Um, these two good pastures are not allowed to have pigs. <laughs> it's a completely another ball of wax on our pig pastures where it's pigs and cows. But here it's chickens and cows generally, although some ducks as well. So this is our upper pasture. It's a wet pasture um, and it, it doesn't have nearly as good a grass as our lower pasture, but we do rotational grazing up there as well. Up there we don't have a permanent hoo house. We have portable hoop houses. So um, there's a slightly different relationship there because the houses are moving all the time. So you're moving around the manure better. Um, and we're trying, what we we're trying to do in that upper pasture was improve the pasture by moving chickens around a lot more. So in this situation, we wanted all that nitrogen on the pasture. So with these portable houses, we're actually moving that poo all over the place where we need it. And thereby, we have to follow the cows as well. This is one of the portable hoop houses with broiler chickens in it and a piece of poultry net. And you can see in front here uh, the cow fence, which is just two strand poly wire. These again, this, I think this is the breeding stock. And these are fairly lightweight hoop houses. The, 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 the exterior depends on the season. Sometimes it's a, a, a better uh, cover than this. In the summer, they don't need much and we can uh, move them with the horses. So they're heavy enough that they don't fly away, and that's really important. If you have a hoop house that's light enough to move by yourself, it's light enough to be moved by the wind as well. Uh, so we want them just heavy enough that they're not gonna tootle away up on that hillside, which can be a danger. In addition to that, Michael has these um, posts that he pounds in or ratchet and then ratchets the building down, so that, that can be done as well. Yes. Are there wheels on that, or is that just totally skidded? That's totally skids. No wheels. Yep. And Friday has no problem with that. And the chickens get really used to it. But you, you, you also need to have an ability to move this thing that won't freak the chickens out, uh, or have a horse that doesn't freak out moving a plastic hoop house through chicken pen. So it's <laughs> you could also probably move this with a small ATV or, or something like that as well. Or two stupid men who don't care about their backs. Yeah, so that, you asked about wheels on it. I've seen wheel systems, we've never done it yet. Ideally, we would have some kind of wheel system on this so we could move it like every two days or every day and a half. As it is with this sort of heavier structure where you need to bring a horse in and things like that, we're not moving it within the small paddock. So like it ends up being in the same place for probably a week, maybe 10 days. You do get some denuding of that area. It gets a little over, fertilized. Um, it is surprisingly though how quick that area will bounce back um, from basically that overgrazed area of, of, of it being there. So it's it's one of the, um, again there's some improvements that can be done but the system works for what we need to do. Um, and we also, we we want them to have good pasture and such but we could also be spending way too much time moving everyone every 12 hours and, and we we don't have the time for it, and we're able to balance that with, um, with still improving the pasture. Yeah, a question over here. Yeah, what's your experience with predators? It seems that they're not enclosed at night. Completely. They are not, no. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. So there is usually two nets, so again, probably about 50 by 100, or 65 by 100. Um, and my, my usual plan for this is that I don't like to make the paddocks so big that the birds can't run back to the hoop house in time. So avoiding really giant paddocks, especially for meat birds that don't run that fast. Um, and not having the paddocks near the hedgerows. Um, our primary predation for these birds <coughs> are owls. Great gray owls, great horned owls. Um, they come down and they take birds right, right there in the yard and eat them. Now, 
to be honest, I don't mind if they take a few birds. I'm willing to donate a few to the local uh, bird population. However, if it becomes a killing session, then, then I'm pissed. But that's not usually the problem. That's not usually birds of prey that are doing that. That would be more like foxes, uh, coyotes, weasels. Oh, man, if you get a weasel, forget it. Um, but we don't have a lot of ground predation. Ground predation is not our issue. We have hot electric fences. We have Scottish Highland cattle. And we have three um, do Bernese Mountain Dogs. So we, we have dogs. Um, yeah, the, oh, the dogs did, yeah. <laughs> we have really good dogs. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about those later. So, Do you have anything about predation? Did I think we're, we're moving, everything is moving around a lot. So I think we'd have a bigger problem if everything was always in the same place. But we're always messing with the situation. There's cows here, there's horses here, chickens here. There aren't chickens. They've been processed. There's chickens over there. And so we're always moving things around. And then the do I think the dogs are probably the biggest thing is that they're, they're there. We have high tensile around everything, which would not keep out most predators. So it's really the, the nets. Um, and then the other thing is um, keeping these nets hot, which is a challenge because um, the, the grass can grow up into, into them. Um, we're attaching them to the main line. We have a very big charger. Um, but when you have 10 nets hooked up to that, plus all your high tensile, you need to really keep an eye on that your that you're, that you're, um, fencing is hot. And so we're testing them. It's at least three, three and a half on our tester. Um, usually it's fine. One trick we do with our nets is um, the way they're powered is there's a, uh, one end of them has all the strands tied together. Um, and, and they keep on, they, they, starting at the top, they connect to all the ones going across. Um, at the bottom, you can, you can disconnect, start disconnecting the wires on the bottom. So your bottom wire or your, your bottom two wires, your bottom three wires are not hot. And so we usually, um, except for the ones we use on chicks, like uh, around our brooder, we've disconnected the bottom one or two wires um, because that's where you get a lot of sagging and it's more likely that will ground out. And people say, oh, well, then it's not hot down there. Well, I'd rather have that bottom two not be hot and the whole rest of the fence be very hot than the whole fence be not hot at all. And, and then, then you just have a, an imperfect barrier. OK, there's a couple of different ways that we handle these portable hoop houses for poultry. Um, and one of them is to bed them, and the other is to not bed them. Um, if, it's, if the weather is atrocious, we have to bed them, because they cannot be sleeping directly on wet ground. And the thing with broilers is they don't generally roost, even if you give them roosts. Although, I have been breeding my birds to roost, and uh, it's improving. So now my king birds, which are these red meat birds, they do roost. Generally, all the hens roost, and a few of the roosters that aren't too fat. Uh, but you know, the, with a broiler bird, a, bre a breeding broiler is an enormous animal. Uh, so roosting can be difficult for them to get up that high. Uh, but I select out my replacement stock from the ones that are roosting. Uh, so that's improved. But if they're ground sleeping birds, like ducks or big fat broilers, you have to bed them when it's wet or, or they'll just be miserable. So that's a case when we bed the structure. If they're roosting birds and there's roosts inside, then you don't need to bed the structure. Here's another example of them uh, in, a, in an off location. This is not in any of our pastures. This is actually used to be an herb field, uh, but we wanted to utilize the grass. So the beauty of having a portable structure like this and portable nets and very portable birds is that we can just move them all over the farm to different locations um, and have them utilize little grass plots that make no sense to fence permanently but could be very valuable forage. And they're safe because of that net and because of the dogs. Did you have a question? Yeah, do you have trouble moving them once you've bedded them? Yeah, that's a really good point about the bedded structures is that they don't then like to be moved. And then you're left with a pile of bedding, uh, which, I mean, luckily for me, sometimes the highlands will go up there and just tear the heck out of it once I put the cows on it because there might be a little bit of grain in there. Um, and even though they're 100% grass-fed cows, they don't quite get that sometimes. So they'll tear it apart, and that helps. Or Michael will go up there and, and rip it up with the harrow. But yeah, it'll, it'll leave a spot. So there's a few issues with grazing the cows with the poultry. And one of them is, is that I have Scottish Highland cows, and they have horns. 
and those horns can be a bit of an issue when you're coming to poultry nets or other things. I don't unfortunately have a picture of a cow in a poultry net because usually it's sort of an emergency and I'm not gonna stop and take photographs. But um, this, this animal named Tyrion, who was a pain in the tuchus for an entire year, um, got his head stuck in everything. And he has tiny horns, so you can imagine some of our older animals with giant horns, um, they can either accidentally get their horns caught up in the nets uh, or they can do it on purpose. Um, I have cows that will lift up fences with their horns to get underneath them uh, and not get zapped through their horns. So um, that's one thing to consider if you have horned cattle is that they can get involved in the nets. And if they're really enthusiastic about the fact that there's grain inside there, then uh, you can have issues. Oh, Tyrion. There he is again. A lot of our, uh, one way to solve that is most of our paddocks, our temporary paddocks within the high tensile, we have one or two strand uh, electric up, and we will put the the nets inside that. So there is so that the rarely are the cows from learning these from nets getting destroyed. Um, are they right up against a, a poultry net? And then the times that they are, we we're probably going to run them through there quicker. So they, they have, they're on this great grass. They have no, way, no reason to look elsewhere. I mean, all these systems, one way they work well with minimal in infrastructure, if the animal wants to be where you put it, it will stay there. But if you're trying to overgraze them um, or not get them what they need, they'll start looking at the other side and, and seeing, oh, is that fence hot enough to get through? Or can I get under this? Or can I get to the, to the next paddock without um, permission from us? <laughs> Um, and just to go back to my original thought on fencing calves is that I did struggle for years trying to keep my calves in the same paddocks as the adults and I have finally completely given up on that idea. Um, and the reason I can do that is because I do have good perimeter netting, or good, good perimeter fencing. This is three strand high tensile, hot, um, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, rely on just a single strand interior wire if I didn't have that good netting. Uh, or I keep saying netting, that good fencing. Um, and that fencing's along our road, along our driveway, near the barn, along the vegetable field, you know, where you have to have a good barrier. Um, and the calves don't go through that. Um, so that's the reason I can trust that. Because with a single strand of electric, they'll just scoot under it and go on to the next paddock when they feel like it. Um, and that, that's not a good idea if you don't have good parameters. <coughs> um, one of the reasons I want to talk a little bit about, oh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Do you get your polywire from Premier? Too? Yeah, all of our polywire comes from Premier as well. We used to use both the, the, wi uh, the wide tape and the single strand. Uh, we just do the single strand now. I mean, early in the beginning, everyone's like, oh, you have to use the wide tape around horses. They'll just charge right through it, blah, blah, blah. Well, our horses don't. So rather than deal with all that wide tape, we just use the, the poly wire because it's a lot cheaper and easier to move around. But yeah, Premier, last, last long time for plastic. Very specific question, but how do well, you... I, those. <laughs> I end up with balls of poly wire anytime <laughs> I move it more. I, I can literally roll it up and then move it 10 feet and then spend half a day untangling it. What yeah, do you do? Don't ever do that. I've tried numerous. I've tried uh, looping it. I've tried balling it. I've tried around yeah. something. Which is, it has to be. A I spool. haven't purchased a spool. Oh. Yeah. yeah, it'll change your life. That and a golf cart will change your life. <laughs> but no, we. At the, end of the end of the year, we put everything on on spools, um, and they make a little uh, handle that goes through it that you can transfer from spool to spool. Um, and anytime we are moving it. We put it back on the spool and it goes off the spool. And the few times, and we always do it every year, we, we're out in a corner of the farm without a spool and we end up with a mess. And if you buy the stuff, then you go, oh, this is expensive and it will last a long time if you take care of it. We still cut it and tie it and things like that and it seems to work fine. But um, it, yeah, you spend a lot of time if you don't handle it correctly. And, and I really think that's a sustainability issue, too. I mean, one thing I hate about 
you know, electric fencing is plastic. It, it has revolutionized grazing, all this electric fencing, but it's all plastic. And so in order for me to feel a tiny bit better about that, I take really good care of it. I mean, reeling it back up, rolling up the nets every season, putting them away, making sure there's no mice, just doing the best that we can to take care of the fencing so it will last as long as possible. There is a question. Yeah, go ahead. How do you roll up the nets? Do you have lawn tools or how do you have No, them? yeah, and that, that's, that, that's how the interns always try to do it the first time, is to roll it up. It's fun to watch. Um, <laughs> No, you gather it up kind of like an accordion, and then you roll up the netting towards the posts and tie it. Um, Premier has some really good examples of that in their catalog. Read the catalog. Even if you don't buy anything from them, this sounds bad, but their catalog is so useful. It's amazing. It has a lot of information in it. Yeah, way back there. Yeah, you. I, just, uh, I was just going to say about the spools. For when you're first starting to buy them, they seem really cost prohibitive because they are. Um, one of the things that I learned this summer, I was up at a uh, farm walk at um, Butterworks Farm with Jack Laser, and they've, they've transitioned to all, um, the, they're the things that uh, you see at any like kind of box store that hold um, uh, extension cords. They're, they're little orange jobbies. They're pretty cheap, mm -hmm. um, much cheaper, and he was using them everywhere. They're really lightweight. So it might be something that people might want to try. Yeah, we, that's really we good We bought idea. like half a dozen of them to try next year. Um, so they're the reels for extension cords? Yeah, they're little orange. Little horn things? With little, little no, no, they're, they're just, they're, they're similar to the spools. No, they're round. And, they're, um, and they, they hold electric uh, uh, extension cords. Um, they're really lightweight. They're pretty cheap. Contractors have them like in their truck everywhere mm -hmm. with all their, their deals. And they're, they're about <coughs> half as much as... And yeah, that's brilliant. Point. Thinking outside the box is very helpful. <laughs> but I, I would add that the, the ones we use, um, they they have a center core through them. I believe those you'd have to kind of take it off. They these spin, and so they're very easy to roll up and 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 not. They're UV treated. They those plastic ones that are orange, I believe they break down a lot quicker. Um, and so we we probably have twelve spools that we've gathered up over the years, and we've never had to replace one. And so we replace the, the the twine that's on the, the wire that's on them, but they will last forever and still have you know value. If we got out of grazing, we could probably get at least 50, 50 cents on the dollar for them as far as them, them still working. So here's another reel that has a spool that can be changed. Right, right. it's a reel uh, that you the spool comes on and off so you can replace it, yeah. And I like it because I can then just hold it as I walk down the fence line um, and it unreels really nicely. Um, so, back to the cows real quick here. Um, one of the reasons that we have the breed that we do is because we knew we were going to do a lot of multi-species grazing to utilize our land the very best that we could. And when we first got there, the, the pastures were rough. Like I said, they had been abandoned a long time. There was a lot of goldenrod, a lot of weeds, a lot of small trees. Um, and we knew that we needed to get that stuff cleared to start improving the pasture. And Scottish Highland cows, well, at least our herd, will eat pretty much anything. Um, and that's been really helpful. They do well on rough grazing. They do spectacular on beautiful grass, so they can go both ways. But I've found them to be just super as far as uh, cleaning up places uh, that other animals might not mess with. Um, and they've helped get rid of the goldenrod, as have the pigs. The pigs have really helped with that as well. Um, so like this is this is one of our milk cows, maybe. And um, what was that, Deary? No, that's maybe. She's only half Scottish Highland, but she has all the attitude. So it's all right. So she's eating lamb's quarters. Our herd is actually also really easy to move around. Uh, they know the drill. I don't have any fancy fencing or handling equipment. We have no handling equipment. Um, all, our, all of our handling of our animals is based on lead animals or based on them being used to being moved around. Um, and so that's been really important for us. If we're going to have a small herd and not have any specialized handling equipment, we have to be able to move our cows around really easily. They have to be tame, as they say. Yeah, in the back. So uh, with no handling facility, is there a vet who will come and treat your cows? You, you're not going to wood, but I don't need a vet yet. I don't. I don't vaccinate cows. We lost cows to black leg. Oh, that'll be fun. So we, now we always vaccinate. 
you know, but yeah, once you get, that was the same with pigs. I didn't vaccinate pigs for years and until we had leptospirosis and then you're like, oh yeah. So no, but currently I do not vaccinate the cattle. Um, but our cows could be tied up and vaccinated individually. Um, probably not the calves, but the mama cows could. We, we have vaccinated before um, and we use a slap shot and that, that was effective, um, but it's not ideal. We load them, they, they go from the holding paddock through the barn and right into the horse trailer. I make that sound easy, but um, sometimes it's like butter and sometimes there's a shadow. You know, it's, um, for the most part, I would say 90% of the time it works out really, really well for us. Occasionally you'll get that one cow, but other than that, it's worked really great. We did set up a, a more semi-permanent handling facility this year with, with portable panels. And so that if there was any hesitation, we had a back panel, so we were able to keep them moving through. But, um, but we've, we've been able to use um, temperament, skill, and a little ingenuity, um, and not force to, to move animals around, including loading them. But we're only trying to load like five beef animals a year. So it's, it's, it's not a lot. That's why it wasn't worth investing in equipment. Um, here we're moving, the, this is what I call the transhumans. Um, this is when we're moving the cows from the main pasture area that you saw previously to our north pasture. And you have to go through the woods to get to the north pasture. So I've put in just temporary single line poly wire through the woods as merely as guidance, really. It's not gonna stop anybody from doing anything, but um, it does guide them through the woods. And after a few years, they totally know the drill. So I could probably take that down. Um, but it's just a, just for precautionary. But I move them through the woods to the north pasture. And in the north pasture is sort of what we call our pig pasture. Um, the reason that it's more of a sacrifice zone is because before we bought the land, they used that pasture for yarding logs during a logging project, and they just tore the pieces out of it. It's, a, it's so lumpy, you can't mow it. Um, it's got a lot of rocks in it and it's got a lot of trees in it. Uh, so we decided that it would be best used as a pig pasture since it was already beat up a bit. Um, but that also means is that we, to keep the grass in check, we do have to graze it with the cows because you can't mow it. Um, you can't clip it with the horses, it's too rough. So we take the cows over there prior uh, to the pig grazing season. There they are in the kind of rough pasture. So they go over there before, usually before we send the pigs over there to put, to get the grass in a reasonable state. You know that early spring flush can be like waist high over there. Uh, so we send the highlands over uh, in strips of like a quarter of an acre strips and graze that down really good before we bring, start bringing the pigs over. And by the time the pigs are over, it'll be starting to regrow. The other nice thing about the north pasture and the other reason why we use it for pigs is that it has all these trees. So we don't, in the summer, need to provide any shelter. We don't take any porta huts in over there or anything in the summer, because all they need is shade, and there's a ton of shade trees, so that works really nicely. Here's the two-strand poly wire with the cows getting the area ready. And then we bring the pigs over once the grass is at a, a reasonable place. Um, this pasture has come through really nicely over the years. I mean, it looks super rough because of all the rocks because the pigs have been digging there for 20 years. But they dug out all the goldenrod and most of the rose and all the big weeds and small trees. And um, even though it's really rocky now, um, it, it produces beautiful grass. So I don't really care <laughs> that, it, that it looks so rough because it grows forage. And since I can clip it with the cows and then send the pigs in, it works fine for us. And you can see all those big trees in the background that we use for shelter. And unlike other places where I wanna rotate, like the water or the feed, so that there doesn't become a dead zone over in my good pastures, here, we leave them in the same spots every single darn time. Because if we moved them, then you'd have a wallow everywhere you'd put the water. As it is now, we have the same wallows in each paddock every year for 20 years. So that's just the wallow, that's the spot. And it fills with water when it rains and it works out really well. And in my really good pastures, I don't think I would want to do that. Because we clip those pastures with, you know, with, a, with a sickle bar mower. Uh, and we move, pull, 
chickens over them, you know, poultry pens and stuff over them, which we couldn't do over here because it's just too rough. There, they're using one of the trees. Oh, I love that boar. So here's an example of, you know, on the right has been either grazed or clipped to prepare it, and on the left it has not. And the pigs love that kind of pasture, that tall, rangy stuff. They love running around in that, but they're just gonna knock it all over. It's way better for me to send my cows in there and actually eat that uh, than just have the pigs knock it all over. And it produces some decent grass. I'm always, I'm always surprised every year when I see what the pigs have done to it that it recovers, yeah. Have you done any seeding after the pigs have been fed? We early on thought of that, uh, and we did it, we've done it in a few places where we weren't gonna bring pigs back to. Um, but we've found that the, if we get them out of there at the appropriate time and don't overdo it, that the sod recovers just fine. Um, and no, we don't. If you denude it completely, then you might want to. It's also really hard in these pastures, because they're rocky pig pastures, that it's hard to harrow. So you'd be broadcasting seed, but then what? I mean, hopefully it would just get rained in or something. How yeah, long do you graze? With, once the pigs, do you go to mud or do you go to... We don't go to mud. That would, that would cause the trouble. Let's see. Um, it's one of our feeders. So this is probably about when it's time to move the pigs. So it's still totally mostly green. Um, there's, of course, going to be some dead spots, but they haven't turned it into mud. This is our ground. It's rocks and it's springs. And so if we take all the cover off of our ground, this is what it looks like. It's a freaking disaster. So we cannot let this happen. Our ground is too wet to really bring it down to anything like this. Some people use pigs to clear land and then, and then grow in them. You're not going to grow anything in that. So it's not like an... What do you want to call it? Yeah, we wouldn't put crops here. That's what I'm saying. That, that's what happens when you thought you had pusher appointments and you find out you don't. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's that's the exact what happened there is that we thought we had pusher appointments and, and we didn't have them. So we had to keep animals on ground for about a month longer than we expected. So, so the way that we handle our piglets is that we put them on the far end of that pasture and we work them in new paddocks every week all the way back. And then by the time it's time to go to the butcher, they're at the gate. And we can back the, the trailer up to uh, their area, leave the trailer there, start feeding them on the trailer, and then close the door and leave. Um, so that's the way that we handle getting the pigs on the trailer after them being on pasture. So they were in that last paddock, and we didn't have an appointment. <laughs> so that was a pain. Um, I wanted to uh, point out in this photo, Back under that tree is the setup that we use for putting piglets on pasture. Um, our piglets are all trained to electric wire as, uh, with their mothers because outside of our sow barn we have electric fencing. But when we put them out alone for the first time, we do a little training again just to make sure. This paddock is away from the main farmyard. And so it's really important that our pigs stay in. I hate pigs out. It is the worst. And it rarely happens to us because we work really hard to prevent it. And so training is super important. They've been trained by their mothers. Uh, but I want to take it one more step. Because usually with their mothers, they're on nets. And the reason they're on nets when they're little is because they're so small. They'll just walk under poly wire. There's no point in putting up poly wire when they're piglets. But when they get weaning age, they don't need nets anymore, but they need to learn about poly wire. So what we do is we bring them over and we make a paddock out of hog panels and put the house in the middle. And within the hog panels is two-strand electric. Because when a pig encounters something that it's not used to, it'll usually go right through it rather than backing off. So rather than risking the chance of them just going right through this two-strand electric, it's inside hog panels. And so if they go forward, they can't keep going. They have to back up because of those hog panels. So after a couple of days of that, they've got it. They're not stupid. They pick it up really fast. And then we release them out into their paddock. And from then on, really, there's no problem. As long as we keep the wires hot and watch for things like branches or sod to be kicked over onto the wires, uh, they're very well behaved. They're surprised when, how do you keep pigs in with just uh, two strand? Um, we find it actually better than, than net generally because with nets, 
they'll push stuff on it and then cover it up and short the entire fence out. With the two strand of poly and the, and the posts, um, we can, as the pigs grow, we just move the lines up higher and higher so that that nose of the pig um, is right at that level. When, it, when it's a piglet, we have it you know, at like six inches and 12 inches. As it gets older, we it may be at 12 inches and 24. We, we gradually move it up. Um, and again, if they're digging right up to it and they um, put some sod over, it's gonna end up going underneath the wire rather than on top of the wire. Um, and then we can keep that wire much hotter and it's much easier to keep um, the portable wire hot than, than a net. And, and easier to move around. And, it, and with the, it's not uncommon with the cow paddocks and the pig paddocks, we can have it all set up for all the cows and then we put a pig in there and we just move the strands down. So we don't, don't even have to move the fence sometimes. We just change the height of, of the fence. So here's um, outside the sow barn, and when the piglets start learning to go outside, uh, the paddock outside the sow barn is a net. And that's for the reason I mentioned prior, is that they're just too small, they'll go right under a poly wire, and I don't want piglets on the outside. So, so they're initially trained on this and then transferred. Make your, uh, ear notching it's, it's the universal ear notching system. Um, yeah. It's the one that the Tamworth Swine Association requires, um, and it's based on the placement of the notch rather than necessarily the number of notches. Sure. But yeah, it, if you have a question, we can just write it later. Yeah. Point you to the, the right. different diagram. One, two, three, four. Yeah. So it, it depends on it depends on where in the ear. Um, the right ear is the litter number of that year, and the left ear is the individual piglet within that litter. So they have two numbers. Um, here's that same training yard that's outside the sow barn. We got cows on one side, pigs on the other. This is just an example that you know all of our livestock are used to each other. And I think that's really important. Um, pigs can be really freaky to some animals. And uh, you want them to grow up around pigs to be used to pigs. I mean, we, can, we could work within this paddock with horses and our horses would not be upset about it. Um, and our cows, you know, say, oh, look, pigs, well, that's totally cool. So they're all used to being around each other, even if they've never had actual nose-to-nose -nose contact, and that's really important. Um, I do want to make a note about boars. This is Brutus. Um, it's really important to be very conscious of boars, just like all male animals. But the only real problem I've had in pasturing different species has been boars. Uh, some boars can be very territorial and uh, don't like cows. So it's just really important to know the personality of your boar uh, and, and keep an eye on those types of aggressions because I did have a boar cut open a cow um, with his tusks. I had a boar cut me open with his tusks. So not, not the, with me, it was not aggression at all. It was a complete mistake. But with the cow, it, he was going after the cow. So with intact male animals, um, you may want to rethink what you're doing depending on the personality of the animal. Yeah? Are you going to talk about your sow barn at all, such a, like the setup of it? Um, probably not too okay. much, no. I'm just curious, do you, do you rotate their pasture at all, or they just have one set? Um, when they're in the sow barn, they just have that outdoor paddock. As soon as the piglets are weaned, the sows all go out to pasture and rebreed, and they come back to the sow barn at the end of the season. Yeah? How do you get, to bo how do you get the pigs to market or to the butcher? We, we have a trailer, we have a stock trailer. Nope, they just go right in the stock trailer. Yep. Um, most times we back the trailer into the, pa or to the edge of the paddock where they are, run the fences right up to the edges of either side of the trailer, and then start feeding them in the trailer so that they become very used to it, and then we just close the door the morning that we need to go. Yeah, I was gonna say, we, have a lot, we used to use old horse trailers um, which were a pain, um, but now we have a, it's a 16 foot trailer, which is really 18 feet, and it's got a divider in the inside, and it's got a, a swinging door in the out, and so I'll come to a paddock, and literally after two or three days, you go in there, you put the feet in there, but they all get in. Um, come to you come early in the morning, they're all sleeping on there, you just shut the door. And so now you have 12, 15 pigs on a trailer, but you don't wanna take 12 or 15. But with the middle, middle door, you can do some sorting in there, release the, the six or eight you don't want to take, um, and, and then be on your way. You have to be careful of things like 
not hooking the electric up to the trailer so that they don't get on the trailer. You gotta make sure that the, you don't expose your trailer lights to the pigs. Um, we've never had them do that, but we've learned from other people that said, oh yeah, they destroyed my trailer, um, things like that. Um, so we really try to, this is one of the things, we, we don't have any pig handling facilities on a pasture. So we use a trailer as that facility and we, we think, okay, we get down on the ground. Does the pig want to get up into the trailer? Is it, you know, is it too high to get in? Do we need to put some straw there? Do we need to, you know, is it cold in the trailer? You know, th th we put some bedding in there so make sure that the piglets, piglets want to go in there. Maybe there's a shelter in there that they prefer to go in. We remove the shelter so they go sleep in the trailer, things like that. Yeah, that's a really good point about if you do use the trailer that way, that's why we back it up to the edge and put the fencing up to the sides so they can just go in and out the back door. We don't leave it parked in the middle of the paddock or yeah, they'll eat all the wiring. Um, I wanna talk about, quickly, I think we're almost, yikes, yeah. Um, I wanna talk about some other benefits of, of doing all the species on our land that we've done. Um, one of them, um, this is, these are my sows out on pasture. Um, one of them I think has been, going back to your question about predators, is that having animals like this out on chicken pastures too, I think has meant a lot. Um, most predators are not gonna mess with a 500 pounds Hamworth sow um, and, or a Scottish Highland mama with a calf. So these animals um, are very useful in deterring predation as well. There are, go back down, there are times where we don't meet the ideal. I mean, this is where we had sows for probably too long. We didn't have a good place to move them. Um, we will not have pigs there next year. Um, they're gonna go on the other side of the fence. And so it got down to where there's still grass there. There's a wallow in the back because there's a spring that comes through, but there's bare ground. And it is not ideal, um, but something we were able to, to, to live with. And it's amazed what that will look like um, the next spring as far as um, that all this clover came up there and it got covered and then we did not, we made sure we did not have pigs there to, to dig it back up. Yeah, like I said, it all works in a perfect world, but <laughs> they're always, always trying to make it perfect. Um, another comment about pigs um, is that sometimes pigs and poultry work well together and sometimes they do not. So be aware of that. Um, my guinea hogs are just the sweetest things in the whole world and they'll live with anybody. In fact, I have one living in my house. So um, that's not gonna be a problem, but I have had Tamworths kill and eat chickens. So it's something to consider that if you're running your pigs near your chickens that they may just become a snack. <laughs> Again, the guineas, no problem. That rooster lived in there with them. Okay, um, and then the final most important part of our multi-species grazing are our dogs. Um, and I really can't praise them enough um, because they have, yes, Dick knows them well. <laughs> um, they're an amazing group of animals and uh, we've tried to maintain three dogs at all times. So there's always an elderly dog uh, and the middle working dog and the young uh, learning dog. And that's worked really, really well for us. Um, we always have a lot of little groups of poultry all over the farm. There are a, there's a lot of wildlife in our area, foxes, coyotes, stray dogs, which are the scariest thing in the world, are stray dogs. Um, and, you know, and we pasture delicate little things like baby ducks. So um, keeping the predators at bay has been really important and the dogs are a huge part of that. Um, our dogs are trained from day one to respect birds, super important. They cannot kill or chase birds. They just can't do it. They are there prote to protect them. So puppies go into layer house with me when I do chores. If it's an aggressive puppy, it may actually be in a crate in the layer house so it can watch the chickens but not chase them. If it's already a good puppy, then it may just go in with me. It really depends on the personality of the dog, but they have to learn right off the bat that birds are, are, are to be protected. Um, I use Bernie's Mountain Dogs and Bernie's Mountain Dog Crosses. So they're not inherently livestock guardian dogs. So they're not like you know a Great Pyrenees that's gonna become attached to their flock and never leave them. They're not quite like that. But what they do do is they patrol the whole farm all night long and keep an eye on things. So there's a combo between guard dog and protecting dog 
and uh, killing dog. Um, they, they, they'll take out raccoons, they'll take out anything they can catch, really. Um, and here's an example of animals you don't want to keep together. Don't keep ducks and chickens together, or waterfowl and chickens together. Um, ducks, this is our, these are two breeding flocks. And I was like, God, I just don't want to set up two places for them over the winter. It's so annoying. I'm just going to put them together. It's a mess. Um, ducks just make a mess, and they don't care. Um, that's how they like it. But chickens want to be warm and dry. And it's not a good combination, so I wouldn't ever recommend that. Again, just going back to, you know, when I have, you know, large horned cows out on pasture with poultry, I feel like they're also doing their role in protecting the life, the protecting the birds. Because they could also have piglets on pasture, the sows, and they're very protective when they have piglets on pasture. There's my babies. I, that was actually just very recently. <laughs> They're going out to get some. So here's, here's, here's the crew. Oh, that's actually Fergus. Oh, Fergus died. Um, so the, the dog on the right is Moira. She's the current working dog, really. She's, she's the head bitch. Um, the one in the middle is, is Reuben, and he's now getting up there a little bit. He wants to sleep in the house sometimes. Uh, and the one on the left was actually our Bernie's Mountain Dog from two years ago who actually passed away as a puppy. Um, and we have a new one, Owen, who's uh, going to be an amazing guard dog. He's super smart. So it's a very important crew, and they know about electric fences. Usually when I go out and move birds, they're with me. They're like, those are my birds. Those are my birds. What are you doing? What are you doing? Those are my birds. Um, and they have uh, amazing, I don't, I don't want to say they have a love for the birds, but they have a sense of protection for the birds. Um, in addition, Moira is a brilliant mover. Um, she's half border collie, and so she can move cattle, uh, horses, she can move pigs, and she can be quiet and soft and move ducks. So I use her to move all the different types of livestock. Yeah? Do you have voice commands for her for moving? How do you get her to move? I, yeah, I do. I am not trained in, in dog training at all. It's been so random over the years, so I have nothing consistent. Uh, I mean, I tell her to wait. And then I tell her to go, and then I tell her to wait, I tell her to go, and I tell her to come around. She'll follow, she'll, she'll follow you, bring the animals toward you? She, no, we, she, we work from behind, always, yeah. And, and I, I definitely, I could never do a sheep dog tryout or anything like that. It's all really individual between me, the dog, and the specific animals we're moving and where we're putting them, but. <laughs> There's Reuben, keep an eye on the cows and horses. And they're all really comfortable with the stock, too, and this is important. I mean, Momo needs to know when she can move the cows and when we're not moving the cows. So unlike a, an actual border collie, she doesn't have to work animals when she doesn't have to work animals. It's beautiful. So that's the beauty of that combo. I don't want a purebred border collie. I don't have enough work for them. And uh, I, don't, I don't need the neuroses. And they get along really well with their pigs, too. Here's Moira, she's gonna help me move these ducks. So she can be aggressive and move cows, or she can be really soft and move the ducks, which is really ideal. Okay, we just have a couple minutes left, amazingly enough. God, it goes so fast. So I just really wanted to, this isn't quite about multi-species grazing, but while I have you here, I wanna talk a little bit about marketing. Um, because as organic producers over the last 20 years, we have seen the market change a tremendous amount. And I feel like when we first started selling organic meat at our market, we were like the freaking cat's meow. And everybody wanted organic meat, and that was really, really important to them. And over the years, that's changed a lot in my view. And I'm so glad a very important person just walked in the room, Matt LaRue. And uh, I'm sure he's going to have some advice on this. But um, it's changed a lot for us. And I feel like more and more over the years that the customer, not all of them, but the vast majority of them are fairly content with non-GMO, local, pasture raised. And that the extra expense and effort that we go to for certified organic is not being valued as much as it used to be. And that's a really big struggle for us because we will not skimp on it. We use all certified organic feed and that's super important to us. These are some of our carcasses. Um, this is our slaughterhouse, uh, Leona Meats. 
They've been amazing for us over the years. They've really helped us produce a beautiful, nice product. Um, but no matter how many labels we have, <laughs> and we have a few, and we try really hard to always be improving our practices, we can always get better at welfare, we can always get better at mean quality, so we're always doing that. But I've found over the last few years that I just don't think it's that important to a lot of our customers anymore. Um, price point has been more important, and if they can find something that's labeled non-GMO and local, that's perfectly fine with them. And I'm not saying that I don't still have a few die-hard customers, uh, but it's a lot fewer than it used to be. And so because of that, and because we're absolutely always on our high horse about this, um, we still feed certified organic feed only, and we're not willing to you know, give up our integrity just for cheap feed. We won't do it. We want to use good feed. We want to use feed that is grown by the farmers in our area who are also using organic practices. And that's really, really important to us. So rather than changing that and getting down off our high horse, we have instead really reduced uh, the amount of meat that we produce. And we may even go to not producing meat anymore. So um, I just want that caveat at the end here that no matter how hard we've worked on our practices over the years, um, sometimes you just got to change. <laughs> Mike, do you have any comments on that? Um, yeah, I mean, it's taken a little more marketing. There's probably more marketing we could do to make our point. Um, we could also market outside the area we currently market. Um, we market really within 30 miles of our farm. Not that customers don't come from farther away um, to us, but we don't sell, um, I mean, we've had, we always get people wanting us to sell eggs in New York City, ship meat and things like that, and we've just decided we don't, don't want to do that. We don't want to ship meat. Um, we've done very, very little of it. Um, and so, yeah, we have reduced production to, this, to some extent by keeping the standards high. Really gone for more of a niche customer, people that do appreciate and will appreciate the product and pay for the product. Um, and I mean, initially when we, when we started, we're, we were like, we're not gonna compete with supermarkets. And, and that really was the, the alternative, was us or the supermarket. But now it's us, the supermarket, or the person that is, the farm that's local that's, um, it doesn't have any kind of certification to prove what they're saying, but also is, is using, maybe they're using non-GMO feed, maybe they're not even making that claim, they're just local, um, and their bacon is half the price of ours, or something like that. And so um, we've just, the main thing we've do, done is some marketing and, and some reduction. Um, and then as we get older, we spend less, uh, less time probably wanting to move animals around and such, and we've been going into plants more. Yeah, Michael has a really good point that uh, part of this is, of course, self-inflicted. <laughs> and the self-inflicted part probably mainly being marketing is that I only want to direct market. I want to hand my pork chops right to the person that's going to eat it, and I've always wanted to do that. When we started this farm, I was a vegan, and it's always been really critical to me to be able to c communicate directly with my customers. Like, I raised this, I killed this, eat this, please. You know, it's like... I want that connection, and the only way to do that is direct marketing at farmer's market. There's really no other way. And so if we were willing to ship to the city or to, oh my gosh, if we wanted to sell through the mail, I know there's avenues where we could keep the farm at a much higher level of production and sell for the price that we want to outside of our immediate community, but we just haven't been willing to do that. Yeah, question. We do want, we do the Ithaca farmer's market. No, because those are usually actually less profitable. And again, I want to I sell directly. And we have a lot of other things that we do. So bring, even if we don't make as much at Farmer's Market on meat as we used to, we sell a lot of other stuff at Farmer's Market, so we still go for that reason. So it's, it's, that's, that's probably our other self-inflicted problem um, is our Farmer's Market stall. Do we sell meat? Right? So even though we have these giant signs and we've been in that stall for 15 years, people still come and say, oh my God, you have meat? <laughs> yes. So that's also self-inflicted. I, I, I grow plants like a crazy woman. And so generally our stall is covered with plants. So it, to the, to the un, unaided eye, you don't know that we even sell meat. So that, that's another issue that we have. Um, this is, a, this is a, point in, a point of that right here. The last day of farmer's market every year, we have what we call our meat sale. 
It's not a sale, nothing's on sale. <laughs> but we put it out. We put it out on the countertops. There's no vegetables, there's no herbs, there's no plants, there's just the meat. And people are like, holy shit, you have meat. I can't believe it, this stuff is beautiful. And it flies. So we know these things, we know the reasons. Um, but we're still stuck in our rut and wanting to do it our own way. So that's the way it's gonna be, right? <laughs> Yes. Yeah. The competition with conventional meat, is that mostly with pork or with beef and chicken and duck? Um, it's mostly with pork. Uh, is there a competition from non-organic meat mostly with pork? And I would say yes, um, because our beef is 100% grass-fed. It's got a little niche, um, being the, I, the you know, only grass-fed high known beef. It's, and we don't we only do five steers a year, so no problem. Our chicken, nobody else raises the chicken we raise because it's our own breed. Um, and so that's a special little niche. But pork is a little bit um, broader. So I would say most of it's come in that. I, we've seen our sales plummet. So. Um, we're about, let's see, out of time. I'm sorry. But um, this is our website, kingbardfarm.com. Um, and there's lots of stuff on there. And you can always email me or Facebook me, or Instagram me. I'm very hip, I'm on all those things now. Um, so if you ever have any questions, or comments, or ideas, always feel free. I, I love to hear from you all. Thank you.